Okay, chapter 28, the baptism, verse 1. Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the stolen admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, of this engrafting into Christ of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ, to walk in the newness of life, which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. The outward element to be used in this sacrament is water, wherewith the party is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. By a minister of the gospel lawfully called thereunto, Dipping of the person into the water is not necessary, but baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. The Holy Ghost has two actions of such faith in and agreement with Christ, but also the entrance of one or both believing parents are to be baptized. Uh, mean, can you authority, authority is a great thing to uh, contempt or neglect this, this audience. It's grace and salvation are not so inseparate, inseparable, inseparably, announced down to it, as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it, or that all that are baptized are undoubt, undoubt, undoubtedly regenerated. Verse 6, the, the efficacy of the baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered, yet notwithstanding, by the values of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whatever of age or infant, as that grace belongs unto according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. The sacrament of baptism is but wants to be administered unto any person. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's go to number one again. Um, Steve, can you explain that a bit to us? And actually, there's a lot in here, so you do your best. Well, Basically, it says that uh, baptism was sacramented by Jesus Christ when he started uh, when his cousin started doing the baptism, and then he also John Baptist started doing baptism, and Jesus also asked his cousin to baptize uh, Jesus himself. guarantee the salvation, but it's, um, how to say, it's a symbolized your salvation. It represents, it's, it's a kind of your declaration of being Christian from now on. It represents that you, you have a, uh, a seal and a sign of Christ or covenant of grace. Um, through the baptism, it means that you accept all, um, let's say, accept God as a Messiah, Savior, and through the baptism, you, your sins are um, how to say, redeemed, redeemed, yeah. You have the remission of sins. 
Um, it also presents that you have a, a new life in this bacterium. So this sacrament was ordained by, by Jesus to be done until, let's say, until his coming. Yeah. Great. Okay. So let me try to point out a couple things from here. Um, so last time we talked about sacraments and we talked about how sacraments are a sign and a seal. And so a sign being that this thing that we do should point of the spiritual reality that this sign is pointing to because of this specific thing there are promises that come from it okay so what do i mean by that with baptism baptism is a sign and a seal of these things of these promises okay so let's be a little bit more specific it says that it's something that's commanded by jesus and it's not only so what that means it's it's also uh, baptism is about uh, being a part of the local church, of the visible church. Okay, so that's the first thing. But here it says it's not only the... Okay, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. A lot of times people think about baptism as only about their own profession of becoming a believer. They think about baptism as only like me saying... I believe, and me getting baptized is uh, me showing a sign that I really do believe it. But then here what it starts off by saying is that you know, baptism is about how you're becoming a part of the local church, how you're becoming a part of the visible church. Okay, so that's the first thing that we need to keep in mind. Baptism is about joining the church. Is it um, like, a specific, like the specific church or like the church? Yeah, so usually um, my understanding is that the visible church is talking about the local body. And so it's, it's talking about these visible churches that are located in all these different places. Um, and yeah, in some ways you can expand it out to like the, the visible church all around the world. Sometimes you do that, but typically it's speaking about the local body. So it doesn't mean that you can't go from one church to another, but it means that you're going to be considered part of that church. Um, so, but it's not only just about that. And so, uh, it also shows that it's it's pointing to the reality. And let me just say all of these things that we're talking about here in one simple term. It's a sign that we're being united with Christ. When we are baptized, we're becoming a part of the body of the church, which shows that we are being united with Christ's body. Okay, so it's showing that we're being united with Christ. And more specifically, it's a sign and a seal of the covenant that we have a relationship with God. It's a sign that we are engrafted into Christ, so that means that we become a part of the vine of Jesus. Um, it means that we're being changed, regenerated, made alive. We were dead in our sins before, but then now we're made alive in Christ. And that our sins are forgiven. And not only that, the last part is that we are walking in newness of life, which means that we're we're being obedient. We're walking as Christians. Um, and so it's a sign, when I get baptized, it's a sign that all of these things are happening in my life and will continue to happen. And it's a seal that God will bring these things about to its totality. So there's a promise that I will be changed and I will continue to grow as a part of this body of believers continue to grow. So that's the seal part of it. And like, like
that speaks that we're, we're supposed to continue this until the until Christ returns. Um, and that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, that we're going to continue to do this, we're commanded to continue to do this um, until the end of the world. Okay, so, so let me just say one more time. Baptism, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, is not just about, it's not, it's not even about a person saying themselves, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to get baptized and that shows my faith. But it's about becoming a part of the church and holding to the promises that are written in the Bible that I am now joined with Christ. And because I'm joined with Christ, all of these benefits of forgiveness of sins, of being part of the family, of being changed and growing and walking in obedience and newness of life, all of these things are now going to be a part of my life. So that's, that's baptism. Now, let me ask you guys, as we think about that, what has been your understanding of baptism? And what has been the teaching of churches that you've been a part of about baptism? My understanding was, I think along the lines of your explanation, except for the visible church part, and it was something that's kind of new to me, mm. uh, that I'm kind of hearing. Mm. And I don't, I don't, I mean, at least from my memory, I don't remember hearing about it, hearing like sermons on baptism mm. uh, from my memory. Yeah. The other things seem pretty in line, I would say. Okay. Mm. However, when I met my Presbyterian friends, uh, I liked that Presbyterian or Reformed view more, mm. although they haven't sold me on infant baptism. <laughs> Aside from that, like this is a much richer application, and the mode in which it's practiced in the church really gives a sense of community. The problem I have is with those diehards who must baptize my infant, and they're not even part of High churches continue this covenantal like, practice without them being really active members. So it becomes like, I don't really care about your child, but I did it because scripture teaches us to do it. But you're not part of my community, so functionally it's like, it's no. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you do confirmation right within those Presbyterian Reformed churches or high churches that have this teaching, it's way richer. I like the point you made about like community, and I think we talked about it last week too. Where yeah, you know, like in the past, um, I do think it's like more individualistic and kind of like ingrained into it. I'd say and we talked about last week how like I think I mentioned like when you see other people baptized, it's not as I think impactful to me as in, like when I was baptized myself. Um, I don't really have the sense of community. Like you're happy for them, but then. It doesn't go further than that. I think the teaching is very important because, like, when the Presbyterian church that I was, uh, my friend went to, they make all the members stand up and affirm the baptismal parents mm -hmm. and we welcome them in along with the members. Mm -hmm. Versus the Baptist tradition, it's kind of more like they all sing, they, they all, because of the Chinese church, they just wanted all of us there, both Chinese and English congregation. But I'm like, I don't know them, they don't know me, and we all have to sit through this, and we, and who screams the loudest? Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, we get baptized. And but there's no teaching that we are one church, and you are now, like, a part of our church. And we just, we didn't have a strong membership. Um, even if they said all members stand up, you're like, uh, some people are not even sure how they're members, but they are. But the Presbyterian churches that my friends were part of, membership is and so each member has a stake. Of course, when your church gets to thousand people, it becomes less intimate and uh, but on small circles, smaller churches like about 100, 200, it makes a difference. But mega church, I see it's really problematic. Mm -hmm. so I haven't seen the Zoomers, but that's like 5,000 people, but now they split. So. Yeah. All 
All right, so, so besides Alex and Jimmy, about other people, what do you guys think? Well, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, although I was never Presbyterian in my way of thinking. Um, actually, I, I didn't know about this part of uh, the baptism to be part of a local church. I never thought about that, this. Um, well, this is my thinking. I don't think this is the most important thing, especially if you cannot um, join a local church. For example, there, is, there was a, um, I think there was a Ethiopian in the way to, I don't know where, to Damascus, in the Bible. Uh, and some, I, I don't, I forgot the, the, the apostle, maybe Andrew? Stephen. Stephen, yeah, myself. No, no, no. Thomas, uh, Thomas. Thomas. No, no, no. Thomas. Ethiopian. It's the Ethiopian eunuch, it's not Thomas. It's, um... No, Andrew. Is it Andrew? No, it's Philip. Philip, yeah. He was like a... Whirlwind. Yeah. Transported to the local, like a... Like yeah. It's a miracle. Yeah. Uh, he preached the gospel. And he baptized the guy, and then the guy, I don't know where he went to. He was reading Isaiah 53, and then uh, Philip was brought next to him by the Lord. And he's yeah. like, do you understand what you're reading? And he explained to him. He opened up the scriptures to him. Because yeah. that New Testament was not written at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after he baptized him, the Lord pulled him away. Yeah. yeah. And he continued to Ethiopia. To yeah. Ethiopia, whatever. Yeah. So he probably congregated any local church in or maybe he started a local church. I don't, we don't know. No, he went to Ethiopia and turned it to another state, right? Historically, like Philip? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he did start a church. Yeah. So, but I think yeah, it's quite important if we start to uh, congregate a local church. But uh, how this is that I, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me respond to that. So in, the, in Acts, because that's where the story comes up, yeah. in Acts, there is this idea that so first of all, before we even look at Acts, one thing that's not mentioned here is that if I were to change the Westminster Confession of Faith, I would add a little bit more. And what it would be is that baptism is a sign of the Holy Spirit's baptism of the people. Mm -hmm. That people are being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Because John the Baptist also said, um, you know, I baptize you with water, but someone's going to come after me that's going to baptize you with fire and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened uh, when they were all praying after Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he went into heaven. They were praying and they were waiting and the Holy Spirit came down with what was like fire resting on them. And so baptism is supposed to be a sign that points to the Holy Spirit's baptism. And when, the Holy, when we believe uh, that the Holy Spirit does come upon us, um, it's not just that moment, but it's just whenever the Spirit is working in us, it's, it's showing that God is working in us to change our hearts, to change so that our sins are forgiven. Uh, we come to realize these things and we begin to trust in God. It's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Um, so, but in the book of Acts, any time that a person gets starts to speak in tongues or when they're baptized and they start to respond um, with speaking in tongues. It's showing that the Spirit has come upon them. And what that shows is that, I mean, it's very specific in Acts. It's the people in Jerusalem that receive the Holy Spirit, and they get included into the family of God. And then it's uh, in Samaria, and in Judea, and those people start to speak in tongues, and they get included into the family. And then later on, it's Cornelius, the Gentile, and his family, and they get included into the family of God. And then later on, through Paul, you see other people getting baptized and speaking in tongues, and then they get included into the family of God. And so in the book of Acts, it's a special time where you, you don't have a lot of these churches all around. Mm -hmm. But the idea of baptism is that now you are included in the family of God where the Spirit is working in you. And so the idea of baptism is that you are now a part of the body of Christ. And so, yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch is an interesting case because we don't see him going into a church. But the idea of him being included.
included in the family is still there. But not necessarily the visible, but necessarily the invisible part of Christ, right? Right, right. Well, so, I mean, I yeah. think as human, do we want to make these special situations principles? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to make the common? Like, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that there's no formula. Yeah. But, but just from a frequency standpoint, if you're going to write about principles, like, do you want to make it on one or very select cases or like, I'm not, you know, like you're absolutely right when you said that the Ethiopian and the Sanjay Kulas was out of nowhere starts. Uh, there's another disciple or someone in his I, I feel like in scripture there was another unique example, but I think like if we're going to write like these these father, these brother, brethren from way back when, mm -hmm. even us, do we want to follow a general principle or, or, or examples or do we always keep So, so the I think what Jimmy is trying to say, and you could correct me if I'm saying it wrongly, but I think what he's trying to say is that, you know, during that time with the Ethiopian eunuch, it was a special circumstance, but that's not the general situation. Mm -hmm. And so, but then that special circumstance, the meaning was that he is included in the family of God. Now, our general practice is that uh, we are able to baptize people so that we can receive them into the local church. Mm -hmm. We can receive them, just like in Acts chapter 2, uh, many people, was it 3,000 people, were baptized, and they were part of the local church at that time. Maybe I'm missing something, but like, part about the visible church, the local church, and in the footnote, I'm kind of like not seeing the exact connection between that footnote and the local church. Yeah. Yeah, so the footnote is pointing to how we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. And so uh, the connection is not very clear, but then if you remember that Corinthians was written to a particular church. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul is trying to make a a statement there in 1 Corinthians 12 about how we are all one body. And so if you guys as the Corinthians have all these different gifts, then these gifts should be used to, to build up the church and remember that you are all one body. And so, it, so Paul is trying to say that to the Corinthian church. So what that means is that um, the idea of one body for the Corinthians is that particular body. And yes, it's true. It could be extended out to, mm -hmm. to be with all other churches. But in the context of what Paul was writing about, he's saying, look, you guys in the church, you guys have different gifts. You guys should love each other. That's 1 Corinthians 13 and then 1 Corinthians 14. Use these gifts also so that other people will come to believe. Um, the context of the Corinthian church. Yeah. 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 There was no Oedipus, and the early Christians couldn't join the synagogue because those men were converted Jews. So the early church was focused on the house churches, mm -hmm. and it's a network, not necessarily a church. Uh, but you recognize them. I think there's other extra biblical material that recognizes all these people. your experience about baptism has been and what your understanding was? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, I, I since you, uh, you 
you mentioned the, the Baptist and the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you, can you repeat just the, say that again? Uh, the relationship between the Baptist and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, John the Baptist said that I baptize you with water, but someone will come after me, and he's talking about Jesus, who will baptize with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that is shown through the Acts 2 situation where the people were praying because after Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, and when they were praying together, that's when the Holy Spirit came down uh, with things that looked like fire, and then that's when people started speaking in tongues. And so, but that was just a symbol also of the idea that the Holy Spirit is with God's people. It had to be shown in a visible way during that time, but it doesn't have to be shown in a visible way today. We know from God's word that the Holy Spirit is with anyone that believes in Jesus Christ. And so, um, yeah, that's the relationship. Now, one thing also to mention is that it's a sign and a seal, meaning that if we are baptized, then it also points to the idea that we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is with us. And so what that means is that, you know, some churches, they think you need to be baptized again and again by the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. Um, some churches believe that, uh, but according to this, if it's pointing to the idea that we are baptized by the Spirit or we're baptized, we only need to be baptized once. And once we are baptized and, uh, and it points to it being a sign and a seal for all of these things that are listed here, then we don't need to keep receiving these promises. We don't need to keep receiving these blessings uh, through a rebaptism of the Holy Spirit and a rebaptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just know that the Holy Spirit comes on us once and that the Holy Spirit is a seal for us for God's promises. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time to discuss this or maybe uh, in the future, but like in Acts 19, um, Paul uh, asked people, do you receive Holy Spirit? And they re replied that they, uh, they had the baptism of John. They had the baptism of John. And then Paul uh, yeah, gave them the Holy Spirit. So what's the, well, how would you explain this? Yeah, so, so we have to understand what the difference is between the baptism of John versus the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so there were a lot of people that were baptized just with the idea of repent so that your sins would for, be forgiven. That was, the, that was the baptism of John the Baptist. And what John the Baptist was doing was he was preparing people for Jesus' coming. So then those people that were baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist was only about getting ready for Jesus Christ to come. So then when Paul heard about these people, and he said, oh, you were only baptized by the baptism of John the Baptist, what that means is that you're not fully understanding Jesus Christ yet. So then, listen about Jesus Christ and the gospel, and fully accept who Jesus is now in your life, and receive the Holy Spirit that brings you into a connection with Jesus now. So the previous baptism is not the same kind of baptism that we talk about today. It was only a preparation baptism through John the Baptist. They didn't really receive forgiveness of sins because of John the Baptist's baptism. It was just pointing to the Messiah that will come. So then that's why they needed to be baptized into the real baptism with Jesus Christ. Yeah. May I speak? 
Um, according to my studies, my readings from Pentecostal and a Revival Church, and also a friend of mine, she was a Presbyterian, and now she went to the other side. In my mind, it's very clear that uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit can happen at the same, same time during the baptism of the water, but not necessary. Sometimes the baptism of the Holy Spirit can happen after if a Christian asks for, and then become all the manifestations, uh, supernatural gifts. Um, this is how the Pentecostal church think, yeah. and also me. Yeah. 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 So something to think about with that idea is um, if the baptism of the Spirit comes after, um, that means, does that mean that the Holy Spirit is not with you? No. It's two different things. Okay. So then when we look at what's the, what does the Holy Spirit actually do in our lives? Um, the Holy Spirit is the one that actually teaches us about God's ways. The Holy Spirit is the one that actually allows us for us to be able to understand our sin, to be convicted of our sin. This is what's talked about in John chapter uh, 14, I think it is. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. So then what the Holy Spirit does is helps us to know who Jesus is. So then if a person says they already believe in Jesus, but they don't have the Spirit in them, then it doesn't really match. It doesn't really make sense. Um, now, some people, uh, charismatics, and I think good charismatics, they talk about how they need, they can have a, a filling of the Spirit over and over again. Not the baptism, but a, a filling, a refilling of the Spirit. And so if they're talking about that, that means they're, they're having this new experience each time where maybe they're uh, feeling, they're feeling very filled with the Spirit. And maybe they have this desire to speak in tongues more or they, they, they have these different gifts that come out. Mm -hmm. okay, so some people talk about it that way. So the question is, is there such a thing as a refilling of the Spirit? Is there such a thing as God's Spirit acting in a more powerful way so that you feel God more. Um, so for that, I would say, let's look at the Bible again and see if there's any situation where it says that the Spirit is moving in a, in a way where he's filling you again, to be filled over and over again. Now, there are ideas where we are being reminded of God's truth, where we are being renewed and, and we're moving from glory to glory. There are these ideas, but does it mean that we are being filled with the Spirit again in a new way so that we have a new and different kind of experience? So I would say we have to look at the Bible again and see how it teaches about what the Spirit does in our lives. Yeah, so I would say just keep looking and studying again. And uh, my, my thinking, my understanding from the Bible is that um, I don't think the Spirit works to fill us in this new way over and over again so that we have to seek this filling of the Spirit. I think the Spirit is with us but then the Spirit continues to work in us so that we can grow in the Lord. And maybe for some charismatics, it's the same meaning. But I know that for other charismatics, there's actually a different kind of meaning to it. And so I would say we have to, we have to look at the Bible and, and really try to understand what does the Bible say about the Spirit, about the filling, about these gifts? What does the Bible really say about these things? Yeah. So I would say... Um, we have to challenge some of these ideas. Yeah. I think uh, looking at the, at the side, because scripture shows it 
single you know, person having a decided or even mm-hmm. similar power. So I think those are special special use cases. But the spirit is always present and always doing the consistent thing of like teaching you, showing you towards your God, stationary prayer for you, uh, helping you more and you have God's heart. But he can give you because I think whenever it talks about Samson being filled with it says, and the spirit came upon him. And then Saul out of the blue he was prophesied. So it's, there, there could be purposes for it, but then he never prophesied after that when Saul left. So, and I believe that God is all present the same with him. So, if God so wills it, like the, the, the Spirit so wills it, then yeah, you can have these extra experiences. But I think the baptism of the Spirit already came when you believed God and decided to obey. Uh, because I think I also read testimonies of modern charismatics that, like contemporary charismatics, where they have lost some of the gifts that they had, the charism, like the the special gifts, I guess, like the tongues. Some people like they don't because they maybe they quench the spirit, and even though the spirit is still dwelling in them, they can't exercise these gifts anymore. But the standard gift of blessing the church and sanctification has always been consistent. So that's how I understand uh, the charismatic. Like somehow God just felt like this group of people should, or you know, they just in this sovereignty enjoy like having these extra little special something. But we all enjoy sanctification and drawing close to God. That's how I understand it. Yeah. So let me just say, you know, I'm not against charismatics, um, and. But I do think that it's important for people to get what they believe in from what the Bible says. And, and I think that there are times in the past where charismatic churches, they teach a certain doctrine. And same thing with Reformed churches, too. Every church, they can teach a certain doctrine, and then the people misunderstand it, and then it causes them to go in the wrong direction. So, like, you know, for example, one of the reform teach- teachings is, you know, because God chose people, then people start thinking, well, that means I don't necessarily need to evangelize anymore because God has chosen people. And so, so then when the reform church teaches this idea and they teach it in a, in a bad way, then these are some of the ideas that people can come with. Now, if a charismatic church teaches the wrong things or or they're trying to teach it, but they're not very clear about the Holy Spirit, then there could be some wrong ideas that come out. So for example, um, you know, they teach that you need to continually be filled by the Holy Spirit, and if you're filled, then you're gonna, you're gonna be able to speak in tongues, and, and that could be a sign of the filling of the Spirit, and, and things like that. And, and so you know, when I talk to some of my charismatic friends, and they're going to a charismatic church, and they say, you know, I, I haven't been able to speak in tongues, and so I feel guilty. I feel like God's not working in my life. I feel like maybe something's wrong with me. And they start doubting themselves. They start doubting their faith in God because they feel like they're not able to speak in tongues. So I would say that's a wrong kind of teaching that's not, that's not very clear, and it gives people these guilty feelings. Yeah. So anyways, I'm not just speaking to you, but I'm just saying, like, this is, this is something that every church, when they teach about these things, they have to be continually going back to the Bible to see what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit, about the gifts, about all of these things. Okay, <clears throat> okay so let's move on. I think number two will be a little bit easier. Alex, you want to? So here, number two, they talk about uh, baptism is with water. I guess the, the element that has to be used. Um, and it has to be gone says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, and then the one that is ministered in the sacrament is doing it lawfully of the gospel. Yeah. Okay, so some people actually might have a problem with this last part. So, you know, some churches, they teach anyone can baptize. But then this, this last part here, according to Westminster Confession of Faith, is that only those people that are called into gospel ministry. So people that are ordained, that are uh, ministers, pastors, um, maybe 
even elders that are ordained. These are the ones that can baptize people, and not just anyone. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but just real quick, what do you guys think of that idea? But what if there is no ordained minister to do the baptism? And actually, I'm looking now the the, the the London Westminster Confession from the Baptist. Yeah. It doesn't say it has to be by a minister. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the things that they changed. Yeah. Right. And also the, the next verse. It's coming from the Baptist point of view. Yeah. yeah. I think my feeling from it is um, as like a, a, oh, oh, like a, a rule or a law to say, I'm not against it really because you even see it in modern society where there needs to be like qualifications for for things to happen or like you know if you want to teach a high level education as a professor you need certificates you need to be you know approved and we see this in every every field so it's not like a, like a weird kind of concept I think it also almost like some accountability uh, in this aspect, and because we know how important it is. But then, you know, like you mentioned, maybe there could be some like some very extreme cases where I don't know, I don't know how to think about it or apply it. I think it's maybe because like uh, technically John the Baptist didn't have a church, but he was obviously recognized. Well, that's a different case. Um, the, the idea is that um, if baptism is a baptism to be joined, to be a part of the body, right? And what, what baptism then is that it's not just just given to anyone that says, you know, um, it's, it's not done in a way so that the person is saying, baptize me, I believe, right? But it's done in a way where it's like, okay, we want to see evidence that God is working in you before we we bring you to be a part of the body. I guess maybe the best thing we're saying is, like, do you want a bunch of, like, these group of Christians and their friend just, like, oh, believe Jesus, and, like, they just baptize them right there. That's the best example I can see. Like, if I used to be youth, I'm like, I can just imagine a bunch of junior high kids. Let's go to the lake. It's like the middle of the night, and they share it with their friends. Like, I believe it's going to the lake. Yeah. Like, is that really what you want? And then, like, if you're in a Baptist church, you're just like, well, why don't I qualify? I firmly believe in Christ. I have the Spirit. And my friend just prayed the prayer. Let's go. Yeah. I think, like, the part about the church actually like, really kind of just, like, If, if, a, if you're part of a church and you have the option, like, why wouldn't you be baptized by uh, like someone that's ordained to do so? Like, why would I just say, okay, I'm going to baptize you, right, when we're like, and the resources available? Like, I'm not just going to baptize my friend. And, like, when we think about also about the faith, and um, how many, like, Christians, how many percent of Christians are, don't go to church or, like, are not part of the church in any way, shape, or form? Where they just have no community at all, and they just gonna be baptized, baptizing their friends or family just out of the blue. So like the situations that come about it of like not being baptized by someone that's ordained is kind of rare to me, and it kind of doesn't make that much sense in my mind, unless it's like a remote island or something. Yeah. yeah. So so we have to keep in mind that the idea of baptism is different between Presbyterians and Baptists because Baptists will say baptism is not about joining the church per se, but it's about their own individual profession. Me getting baptized is about me sharing with all of you guys that I am a Christian. Whereas the Presbyterian point of view is saying it's not about your personal profession. It's about the church recognizing God's work in you and now receiving you. And so that's why the church is baptizing you, not you baptizing yourself. 
church is baptizing you and the church's authority figures are the ones that are helping in the process of recognizing God's work in your life. And so, so a person professing their faith is one of the evidences that God is working in you. And so, so then the church says, okay, we see that God is working in you and we want to baptize you and welcome you into our church. Whereas from a Baptist point of view, it's not, you don't technically even need someone to baptize you if it's about your own profession saying, I'm showing the world that I am a Christian now. In a way, technically, they will, they will never say this, but technically, they could baptize themselves. Yeah, why don't they just like that? They just so they shower. But they do care. No, they do care about scripture. Like, like, I mean, we won't be so flippant about our critique of them. Like, they're not like anti factor Like, their attitude is like because the language is baptism conferred by someone. You don't right. baptize yourself. That's why they don't do it. So they do respect scripture. Yes. Yeah, so that's yeah. why they don't like to shout. I'm not, I'm, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying, you know, Baptists are bad. Or yeah, 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 no, I'm, no, no. I'm saying if you <laughs> follow the logic, yeah. if you follow the logic of why, what yeah, they yeah, consider yeah, Baptism yeah, yeah. to be, then then this is something that can also be possibly accepted. Well, you could just see it from the churches that they have a, like, the, the ceremony and the way they do is like a much less respect. It's like, a, like, like the higher churches, they do communion every week because they, 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 re, they celebrate it and it's festive. And the Baptist is like, we just have to do it because it's listed. So it's an attitude as well. Like I see it progressing in like a number of the Baptist, like influenced churches. They're not non-original, but they have a Baptist influence. And I think from a richness standpoint and application standpoint, it's your growth would be better if you had this covenantal like group invite attitude versus the Baptist world is cleaner, it's functional for missions without, like in a no church setting, if you just have the missionary or if God all of a sudden like called you to faith in a dream, like a you know, Muslim background believer, like it's kind of like, it makes sense in that scenario. Uh, but then they also hold a very low view of baptism as like, which is, I think the Westminster Convention also affirms that baptism does not sound like Right. Uh, so in that sense, like, but because they have such a low view of it, they're just kind of like, why do you do it? No, uh, you don't have to do it, but it's nice and Jesus commanded it, so you do it because it's commanded. So in that sense, like, that's why it's very weak. Well, I just want to be clear um, that I'm not wanting to ask other groups out there. You know, I would still call a person that has charismatic beliefs a brother in Christ, and I will still call Baptists brothers in Christ, and and I think that they have good argumentation for why they believe what they believe. Um, but what I'm saying is that this is the point of view that the Westminster Confession of Faith is coming from, and if you follow the logic of of a particular point of view, then this is what you can possibly result. This is the result that you'll have. And so that's that's all. I'm um, I have friends that are in the Baptist camp and Charismatics. I have friends in all of these different camps, and I do believe that they are my brothers in Christ, and I pray with them, and I can have fellowship with them. So I just want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so for the sake of time, let's try to go a little bit more quickly. Uh, Jimmy, well, I'm, I'm number three. Uh, dipping of the person into the water is not necessary, but baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. Okay, so it's saying... Dipping the person in water is not necessary. Okay, the way that I take it, other Presbyterians, they take it a little bit differently, but the way that I take it is dipping is okay, but it's not necessary, as some people might say. Um, but baptism, and some people, other people will want to emphasize this part, baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. Okay, so I wouldn't say this means that this is the only way. Some Presbyterians, they think pouring or sprinkling is the only way, and you shouldn't be immersing people. But but I take this to, under, I take this to mean that you can do dipping, you can do immersing, but sprinkling or pouring is, is good. And uh, part of the reason is because it symbolizes the pouring out of the Holy 
Holy Spirit on people. And that's why when you guys see me baptize people, I try to get as much water in my hand and I pour it on people's head mm -hmm. because it's supposed to symbolize the coming down of the Holy Spirit onto a person. That's why I do that. Um, <laughs> number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, for fun. Okay, so, so that's what number three is about. Okay, number four, Jimmy, can you... Not only uh, that, not only those that do actually participate in uh, obedience unto Christ, but also the instance of one or both being parents can be baptized. Uh, it's actually they're saying basically in the baptism of the household, if, if the household that has the leaders of the household has affirmed Christ and they, uh, I don't know if it says it, but I feel like they draw from like Abraham circumcised his whole household, uh, Cornelius' household was baptized, and under those passages, I didn't read all the passages, but it's because um, you're inviting the whole family into the faith, so you assume that the leader or the head of the household will, like, propagate the faith and have their family follow right. uh, like in suit. Right, right. So when a person, so, so this you have to keep in mind the idea that this is coming from the point of view that if a person is baptized, then they're welcoming them into the church. So if a person is welcomed into the church, they're not going to leave their children out and say, you know, children, don't come to the church. They're going to welcome the children also. And then the church, together with the parents, are going to teach the kids to grow up in the Lord. And so it's, we're going to be teaching the kids as if they believe in Jesus Christ also. So I'll just point out one verse in Acts 2, 38 and 39. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, uh, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so because... The promise is not only for you, but also for your children and for anyone that God calls. So that's why um, we want to receive the children also into the church body and baptize them and receive them into the church body. It's not about whether they are professing their faith in Christ or not. It's about saying that the promise of, promises of God can also be applied to you as we teach you God's ways and as we see God working in your life. Okay, so um, number five. We have to start wrapping up. All right, so uh, let's try to do this quickly. Mean, can you, can you explain number five to us? Mean your your mic is muted. So if we ignore or we condemn the baptism, it's a it's a it's a gracing. And but grace and salvation are not connected to to the baptism. Um, however. Uh, Person must, a person can be regenerated, or if I think they they need to be baptized. Yeah. Okay. So, so baptism doesn't save. Is that that's what it's saying here? But we shouldn't ignore baptism. We should obey Jesus and keep baptizing people. Uh, but it's not what saves people. So one thing to consider is that there are some churches that really emphasize baptism. You know, you ask their testimony. When, when were you saved? When were you, uh, when did you become a believer in Jesus Christ? And some people, they share their testimony and they talk about how they got baptized. But that's not, that's not necessarily what being saved is about. Okay, so being saved is about how did you come to believe in Jesus Christ? How did you come to realize your sin? That's, that's what it's about. And so we need to make sure that we make a distinction between baptism and being saved. Baptism doesn't save you. But it's part of something that we do in obedience to Christ. Um, 
And, but also at the same time, we shouldn't neglect it. All right, number six was that, yes. I think you just kind of explain a little. The number six, right? It, it, it gets you, but it's not tied to the moment of time very, very administered. So that means, what you just explained, the salvation itself, it comes at the moment when you accept Jesus as your Savior. And the baptism is just um, a sacrament ordained by, by Christ, kind of formality, but uh, let's say a must do thing. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. So, the only thing I'll add on to that, we got to get going soon, so. We'll finish up real soon. But the only thing to add on to this, uh, what Steve just said, is that um, your baptism is not necessarily, the day that you get baptized is not necessarily the time that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and starts working in you. Actually, a lot of times, I think the Holy Spirit comes into a person to work in them even before the day of baptism, if they really come to believe. Or maybe some people, they got baptized, and they actually didn't believe, and they didn't know what they're, why they're getting baptized. Yeah. Like some churches, they say, oh, you're new to the church? Get baptized today. And, and they don't even know why they get baptized. Right? And maybe at a later point, they really come to believe, and that's when the Holy Spirit is working in them. So, and the last, last point is that the baptism should be only given to a person one time. And it shouldn't be something that you do over and over again. And we could talk about that another time. But 